Thank you, and um, yeah, thank you that you all made this to the last presentation. <laughs> this is really cool. So yeah, today, um, as you can see, um, I would like to talk about a topic that we actually face a lot during our client engagement, and this is namely actually to put data science models into production. And um, yeah, so I actually had a slide for myself. So I'm a, as I said, as you already said, I'm a data scientist at Pivot Labs. I'm based in the Berlin office. And um, this is my GitHub account. Uh, you can find the code of the demo that I'm also doing uh, on this account. And yeah, this is uh, my uh, Twitter handler as well. Sorry. OK, uh, so let's start with defining the problem that we actually have uh, with our clients. So let's say, um, yeah, as this, this is a, this is a uh, full stack data scientist and um, he has a background in statistics, so looks quite nerdy, right? And um, he's just been hired by a company um, which hasn't had data science before and um, the company wants to be more data driven, right? So like many companies t today because, yeah, you know, data science is cool, big data is cool, right? <laughs> And, okay, what do you first uh, as a data scientist? Well, of course, uh, you start digging in the data, right? So you review the data, uh, you clean the data, and, of course, you're trying to create meaningful uh, features of it. And um, as you can see on this slide, um, the data amount is huge. Uh, so it's a uh, heaven for a data scientist. So the next step, of course, um, as a data scientist, probably you're building a machine learning model, right? So you cross relate your model, and then you create a per actually you create a perfect prediction model. The question is then, what happens next, right? Usually, at most companies, um, you probably prepare a presentation, and uh, you probably present those findings to your management and your team, right? So, uh, who have you actually worked as a data scientist uh, in a company? Right, okay, it's not so much. <laughs> well, of course, I like this picture um, here. Um, they think it's actually cool, so your management likes it. And you show them your results and, um, oh, my mouse. And, and uh, actually, yeah, your model is really solving a business problem. Oh. After presentation, after your presentation, you're like this guy, you know? Like, uh, you know what the Brexit is, right? So everyone probably heard of the Brexit. <laughs> you heard of the Brexit, so you're super enthusiastic like Nigel Farage that uh, your work would change the world, right? And you think that it's just a matter of days that your work will go live and will be used by thousands of uh, users. But like, in, like the Brexit, uh, you face reality. So uh, you realize that it takes some time, right? And, uh, and it's actually a very long time now. So uh, as Actually, all those guys, they thought that they could go out earlier from, from the European Union, but uh, this is not probably going to happen. Well, yeah, in reality, this is actually what happens. Uh, so at many engagements with our clients, we've seen that uh, all those re results that we created uh, are going to be unused. And they're literally thrown into this um, trash can here. So that's why I call it sm smart, because it has many smart results, all right? So what is the problem uh, why models are not being put into production? Well, we've seen that um, data scientists speak different languages. So diff data scientists speak, for example, R, Python, or SAS, right? Where uh, software engineers, they speak like um, Ruby, Swift, or, or uh, Go. So if you attended uh, Peter Wong's talk yesterday, uh, he already said that data science is not not like uh, software engineering, so this is also here the case. And basically, it's also not about the a programming language problem, but it's also kind of a technical problem. So, for example, as a data scientist, uh, I have a statistic back. I have a background in statistics, so I talk a lot about models and uh, how can I improve them or or distribution, right? Whereas the software engineer is probably talking about how can I write a test? How can this test pass or not, right? If you ever face this problem, and of course. Due to this problem, due to the difference that you have, um, and sometimes it takes months until a model is going to be in production because uh, the data scientists have to understand the software engineers and the software engineers have to understand the data scientists. And in many cases, uh, uh, models will never go into production at all because uh, they just hate each other. <laughs> so what is the solution um, to, to this problem? 
Well, at Pivotal Labs, uh, we basically um, follow an API-first approach. So um, what does API-first mean? So API-first means that you try to wrap everything as an API and create microservices. So um, in this case, for example, you could have, um, yeah. I just, sorry, I just really right. So you could write, you could have a one service that, for example, do the prediction, right? You have one service that cleans the data. You have one service that processes the data. You have one service that that adds metadata to it, and you have, of course, one service that consumes it. Uh, an example, for example, uh, could be like, for example, Amazon, right? So what do what does uh, Amazon do? So they do e-commerce. Uh, you, if you go on the Amazon website, you can uh, buy their products. And of course, another important um, element of, of, their, of their product is their recommendation engine. And basically, those services that I described could be decoupled uh, each other. So you could have one service that just serves as a basket, right? And the other service is uh, the recommendation engine. So what is the advantage um, of this approach? So, uh, basically, uh, one of the biggest advantage, of course, is each team can focus what are they good at. So the data science can still use R, they can use Python, they can use SAS, SQL, and uh, the software engineers, they can use Java, they can use Go, they can use Swift, so they don't need to learn, understand each other, actually. Um, another um, advantage is, of course, scalability. So because you create uh, independent services, um, you can scale them up independently uh, as well. So, for example, let's say if you um, start a new startup, right, um, you uh, uh, create a new website, and uh, of course, when you start the startup, you don't have many users. But uh, what happens when you go to TechCrunch, right? So when you attend TechCrunch, you, you, you might get a lot of buzz. And then, uh, of course, if you have this uh, kind of uh, old architecture, right, uh, this could happen that uh, your, your website would crash. So your customer experience would be quite bad, right? And um, if you, and in, the, in, in the modern cloud-native architecture, I would call it, um, you don't have this problem anymore. So you can scale up your system independently, and you won't have this problem. Another uh, advantage is, of course, um, as you can see, since you're decoupling your, your services, uh, each team can work on smaller problems so that they can um, shift uh, the code faster. Uh, now I want to give you an example because, uh, of course, the, this thing that I said before is, yeah, it's quite uh, abstract. So. So for this example, I actually will use the famous Abnis dat data set. So probably all of you know it, right? It's uh, on Kaggle. Um, the data set consists of 60,000 uh, training and 10,000 testing images with a size of 28 times 28. And um, the problem is actually to recognize um, handwritten numbers from 0 to 9. And um, yeah. And um, so the, the demo can be found on my GitHub account. Um, unfortunately, um, I only had two days to do this, so the documentation is uh, still bad. So if, if you have any questions afterwards, you can yeah, write, write me or <laughs> just uh, yeah, come by after the talk. So OK, so usually um, in our data science uh, engagement, we actually have two phases. Uh, one phase is an exploration phase, and the other one is a production phase. So um, during, typically, uh, during an um, exploration phase, uh, we actually experiment with a lot of different models and um, approaches to solve our problem. And this phase is usually not test-driven, and we use interactive tools like uh, Jupyter Notebooks or, or RStudio uh, or Sepl Apache Zeppelin uh, to create model prototypes or just to get a visual understanding uh, of data like plotting it. And um, in our example, um, the MNIST problem is typically a classification problem, right? Because you, you know the, the, the target class is uh, integer, right, from 0 to 9, and which basically can solve by many uh, approaches. For example, you can use logistic regression, you could use uh, support vector machines, um, or anything else. And, but in this case, we actually using a deep learning uh, model. So particularly, it is just a multi-layer perceptron. Um, and a multi-layer Pesatron is basically just a feed-forward artificial neural network and especially good in learning nonlinear relations uh, in the data. 
so as you can see on this graph here, um, in our case, we feed images of uh, handwritten digits, right, with 28 times 28 in the input layer. Then uh, we will have some a uh, couple of hidden layers because, um, as I said, it's a multi-layer positron, so um, it's more than one layer hidden layer that we have. And in the output layer, we will have um, several outputs um, because uh, it's not a it's not a binary classification, right? It's a multi-class classification, and um, Basically, to create our models, um, I, we will, I use uh, Keras. So Keras is a deep learning library written in Python um, that can be run on top of either Theano or TensorFlow. And Keras is especially um, designed for fast prototyping. And um, if you haven't used it so far, you should check it out. So it's a really cool uh, library. So all right. Let's, let's continue with the demo. So, of course, uh, first we load the data. Uh, luckily, uh, in this case, because I was just preparing this demo to show you what API first means, but luckily Keras has already some built-in data sets, so, uh, um, including the um, MNIST data set, which actually is, is used to demonstrate Keras capabilities. Um, using this option, we can easily load the data and get the train and uh, test data set. And um, of course, in reality, um, this is not straightforward, right? So normally, the data that uh, we get from our client is quite messy. And we actually uh, spend a substantial amount of time to understand the data, to clean the data, and to transform the data. Um, as you can see, uh, in this case, basically what we just did is we, we, we uh, flattened the, the the, the vector, right, and then we did some transformation, like for example, normalizing the feature space to zero and one. Um, as I said, we, we, we get some images, right, so it's in uh, RGB, and uh, if, you, if you know that the intensity is from zero to 200, 255, right, you divide it by 255 to normalize it between zero and one. And this is especially useful because um, if you normalize it, this is faster uh, for calculation in a neural network. So then we finally create the MLP model, so the multi-layer perceptron model, right? So in this case, as I said, we have two hidden layers. Uh, we have troubled at each the hidden layer, and uh, we use ReLU activation. As you can see, the input size is 784. So uh, 784 because um, the image size is 28 times 28, right? So if you multiply it, you, you get 784 because we just flatten the vector. And for the output layer, we use uh, softmax since it's uh, a multi-class problem. Um, if, if you, uh, for example, use a binary classification, you probably would use then uh, a sigmoid function. So afterwards, we train and evaluate our model. Um, in this case, uh, we are using um, accuracy as an eva um, evaluation matrix. So we, we, the reason why I use accuracy is that the class weren't um, unbal uh, unbalanced, so there were no pro so they were quite balanced. There were no problems with it, so that's why I didn't use uh, precision recall. And um, basically, use batch size of 128 and just 20 epochs, so really standard uh, numbers for that. And also, I did some uh, in-sample cross-validation. And um, the result that I got was pretty good, so it was um, approximately 98%. And um, based on the model performance, uh, usually in our engagement, we can actually try to improve this model. Uh, but in our case, the model is already performing quite well, so that we can use it for our f for the app, I would say, uh, for our services. And um, basically, what we do now is we restore the model. Um, Keras normally stores the model separately, so basically, you have a network architecture that it stores, and also the model weights. So. Now we know that the model is performing quite well, but what happens now, right? So uh, we, if you, if you want to put a data science model into production and, and want to use it by, by users, um, there got to be something, right? Because, um, for example, many data scientists just, just, uh, just try to play around, right? Uh, do some plotting and something like this. It's, it's really cool, it's okay, but uh, if it's not used every day, uh, it's going to die anyway, right? So in this case, um, we, we need to think about how to design actually like an interaction point so that, can, that we can use this model or that, that um, users can access this model. And um, 
as far as I said, uh, we've been working with images of 28 times 28, um, which is probably not optimal, right, if you do an app or like uh, if you have a sketch pad in, in this case. So uh, just imagine you have a sketch size of 28 times 28, so it's really small, so you can't draw anything. So it would be probably optimal to increase the size of the images, right, well, the sketch pad where you can draw something. And um, if having those thoughts in mind, how to actually um, design this app or API, um, it would now make sense to, 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 to put this into production now. And, and basically what we do at Pivot Labs is we pair with um, software engineers. So have you guys heard of pair programming? Cool, that's cool. It's a very cool way to uh, write code, so you <laughs> should definitely try it out. So the next phase that we have is called uh, the production phase. Um, at this stage, um, we start to do test-driven development. So, and this is really good because TDD helps actually uh, to keep our code uh, base clean and trustworthy. And the user flow is like this. So we usually we write um, failing tests, and then we make the test pass, right? So, and, um, and then we refactor our code, and, and then uh, this iteration goes again and again until we are satisfied um, with our code. Um, usually we separate the code from the exploration phase and production. So if we, uh, we are moving ba basically actually from a Jupyter notebook to scripts, right? Because you cannot test a Jupyter notebook, right? So probably it makes sense to do it in a script. And uh, usually uh, we pair a lot then with software engineers to, to develop this code. Um, in our example, um, we basically have three services. So one, ser one service that actually trains the model and stores the output to a key value store. Um, in this case, I use Redis, which is a very simple uh, cache layer. So um, it has also a very good um, uh, connection to Python. And we have another one that basically exposes the model as a RESTful API. And of course, the last one is there is an app that basically consumes the API, in our case, um, which is a sketch pad. Um, for, for exposing the model, um, I use Flask, which probably all of you know, right? So it is a very lightweighted uh, web framework and uh, much easier than Django. And um, yeah, in this case, what I did was um, I'm posting images right um, to 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 the API endpoint. Um, then um, what I did, as I said, uh, I need to resize or convert the images in some way, right? Because um, if you have like 28 times 28, uh, it's not optimal. So you increase the 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 size of the image and then you decrease it again. And then what I did here is um, I got a model from Redis, and then uh, the model is then used to, to predict uh, um, the, the digits. And then I return, what I get back is uh, basically um, the prediction. Um, for the sketchpad, um, basically um, my, my a colleague of mine, so from a labs colleague, worked on that, so she was using sketch.es which is a simple Canva-based drawing tool for jQuery um, to create the sketchpad. And basically, um, it consumes from the prediction API. And um, to serve the, the application, we were using um, Sinatra, which, uh, was use, uh, which is written in Ruby. So yeah, for, for deployment and testing of, of our apps, we are uh, using Cloud Foundry. Um, actually, we're using um, a development version of Cloud Foundry, so PCF Dev, which is just a smaller distribution of uh, PCF. Have you all heard of P uh, Cloud Foundry? Do so you know what it is? Uh, have you heard of Heroku? Right, okay. So uh, Cloud Foundry is similar to, I would say, uh, take the same idea as uh, Heroku, but uh, Heroku is uh, like a public uh, cloud, right? And um, whereas if you use Cloud Foundry, you can use it also in a private cloud. And this is especially uh, good if you are a company, right? Because they don't want to put everything uh, on the cloud. So that is actually the main difference. So, and basically, um, as what this quote said, right? So you, you write your application, right? You have a source code. To, you, you just do CF push. So you use your command line. You do, you do CF push. And then uh, it's just running on the cloud for you, right? And you don't, you, don't care, you don't need to care about anything else then. So in this case, 
what we, what we do is we have uh, like these three applications, right? Um, this is the application we, we need to write a manifest YAML file. So in this manifest YAML file, you you define the name of the app, you define uh, the dependencies, right? So for example, uh, in the, for example, for for Ruby, you need a Ruby build pack. For Python, you need a Python build pack. And um, essentially, in a Python build pack, which is pretty pretty cool, you just need to um, write one line that it needs Python. And then you need just to put your environment YAML file, which you get from Condor, right? And then uh, what it does then, you, you do CF push. Um, it will go to this, um, yeah, to this area here, to this um, block. And then what it does, um, it basically um, pulls all the dependencies from Connor for you, creates a container, right? And then what it does, it will create, a, like we call it a droplet, it executes the app, and then it's just online. So that's pretty, pretty cool. And it would take care of a lot of things, for example, uh, load balancing, so you don't need to take care of load balancing, you don't care about security, right? You don't need to care about routing, so Cloud Foundry is taking care of all of this. Uh, yeah, so, um, as you can see, um, you can have a free trial, so you can register on uh, our free trial version. So there's a free trial version on uh, run.pivotal.io, or you, uh, it's actually 90 days, I think. So just check it out. Um, or you could use um, the PCF dev version, which is basically a local virtual machine. Um, I did it, so it's also good. It's free, so it's worth trying it out. And um, on this repo here, the GitHub repo for my colleague. Um, he actually has a lot of examples of how to actually push uh, um, a Python app um, on Cloud Foundry. And there's actually this super amazing talk from uh, one of our uh, technical program manager about CF. From, he's called Onzi. Um, it's a really good uh, YouTube video, so check it out. Right. And um, as a CI and um, um, CD tool, so you, you do know, all of you guys know what CI and CD means? Okay, so CI stands for continuous integration and CD stands for continuous delivery. Um, usually in software engineering, um, you, you, we work with Git, right? So, or any version control. So what we do is we try to integrate code as much as possible, especially if you work in a team, right? Uh, if, you, if you don't do this, you will get a lot of uh, merge er errors and something like this. And continuous delivery is basically extending the CI uh, idea, right? So you wanna um, have production ready code um, as uh, early as possible, right? So you just need to push anything and then it will be uh, deployed. And the advantage uh, which, uh, so we are we're using Conquer CI, um, and the advantage with Conquer CI is um, you can create pipelines and uh, basically the test environment um, are, are dockers. So uh, hence, if you, if you use this, um, the test always starts from scratch. And um, this is good because if you ever use Jenkins or Travis or something like this before, uh, you know that you will get some kind of a shared test environment, right? So you cannot uh, reuse it again or you have to um, reinitiate your, 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 uh, your Jenkins again. And um, of course, one of the reasons why we use it is it natively supports Cloud Foundry. And also, a very cool thing is, um, you, like Jenkins is a very web-based uh, CI tool, uh, whereas if you use Conqueror CI, it's, uh, you can programmatically write your, your pipeline. So it's, uh, it's essentially just a, um, a YAML file. Um, in this picture, you can see that we actually have two spaces. So one is uh, for testing, and the other one is for production. And the production, in this case, is only triggered if there's a new tech version of the code, for example, on GitHub. Well, and this, is, this makes sense because um, as you might do some, uh, well, this might make sense because you might do some user tests, right, for your app with a smaller amount of users instead of uh, all users in production, right? So this is, so testing is not about all code testing, right? It's all about also about interface and uh, app testing. So this is also important. Um, yeah, so basically this is a live, uh, this is the app, uh, um, this is a demo of the app which, I, uh, which is hosted on uh, PWS. So um, I actually can go to this one. Uh, uh, right here. So basically you have uh, four buttons, so it's a marker, eraser, download and predict. 
And um, let me also open inspect. Oh, man. OK, this is not optimal. <laughs> Uh, okay, it's not a good idea, so you, I can't really see the, uh, the prediction endpoint, but for example, when I just draw something, right, so, uh, what the fuck? Oh, okay. So there's, an, there's, an, uh, there's something. <laughs> So basically, what it does this is this is uh, this is an application which runs on its own services, right? And then you have the prediction API, which also is also an independent service, and uh, basically it's just connect to each other. So every time you 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 write something, you send uh, the picture to the endpoint, right? So it's basically two different uh, services that it is running, and you can uh, basically scale it up um, independently, which is pretty cool, right? If you like, for example, have a lot of load in the future, it's uh, elastic, right? So uh, you can scale um, instances if you, if you have more uh, people coming to this uh, uh, website. And um, yeah, of course, it's, it's, actually it's not perfect. So for example, I think I always have a problem with four. So, and also my handwriting is not very good, so <laughs> just bear with it. So if you do predict, okay, this, this was a good thing, I don't know. <laughs> Because usually when I do four, I, I, I sometimes I get a lot of eights. So because I'm not quite sure what's happening, but of course uh, this was a very simple data set, right? And the model was also pretty simple. Um, actually, if you go onto uh, Lacoon's website, so he's uh, he's doing a lot into this area with uh, um, image classification and so on. Uh, you will get actually uh, different models, better models. So basically, uh, you can also use this model. Okay, uh, let me go back to my slides. Okay. All right, so this, what are the key takeaways uh, of this presentation? Well, so put models into production, right? Because then, they are, then there's a high chance that they, are, um, su that they survive and are uh, used by users, right? This is uh, very important. Um, Try to use API, right? Try to create uh, services because uh, this is easier and um, this is uh, better for, for different teams because they can they can uh, connect to each other without understanding each other. It's like it's like a, I think like a relationship between I don't know like a girl and a boy, right? <laughs> Try to think, find something where you can connect to each other. <laughs> And um, of course, um, think about wrapping your data science model as uh, early as possible. And um, yeah, of course, so uh, deploy your code as uh, early and as often as possible so that users can test it and give early and regular feedback. Um, use a suitable continuous delivery tool um, that automatically deploy your, your code. So try to do this even uh, if you're not familiar with this. It is really worth it. So um, I'm actually don't, also don't have a background in software engineering, but I learned a lot from my colleagues in, in, uh, at Pivotal Labs. So it's really great. It really helps us to, to write better code and also to deploy things faster. Um, if, you, if you don't want to use uh, Concurs, um, it's okay. There are many other tools outside, right? There are uh, Travis, there are Jenkins. Um, try out one of them. Um, do TDD. So um, when I started with with uh, at Labs, I was really really um, yeah confused about testing, right? So if you have a background in statistics, you know you're like, what what is test? Why do I have to test my code? You know, it's like uh, why do I need to do that? But it really helped me to to uh, actually improve my code and. Um, and uh, it's, it's really useful. So we have a lot of uh, blogs actually on uh, Pivotal Engineering about how to write tests. So this is also worth checking it out. And of course, T 
TDD is actually not appropriate for, for all uh, data science phases, right? So I had this um, phase split between exploration phase and um, production phase. So it's, from, 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 our, from my experiences, uh, TDD is not useful uh, if you are in the exploration phase. So if you're trying to, to uh, uh, experiment and, 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 and um, with, with different models and solving your problem, right? And, uh, but it is very useful if you put your code into production, right? Because uh, just imagine if you have to change something later in your pipeline, um, it really improves actually to, 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 to change the code without uh, or ha having to worry that something might fail. Uh, and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for the, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, now I'm open to questions. Here first. Uh, there was a talk yesterday on uh, using uh, like uh, a different framework other than like Django and uh, I think it was like Kong, uh, Falcon or something. That, what? what? Uh, Falcon or Co had some like bird name. Anyway, it was uh, okay. <laughs> it was it was kind of taking the approach of, it, of like when you your microservice starts to get a lot of hits, like particularly the data science thing. Instead of like scaling it up yeah. by scaling the number of instances using like multi-threading basically. Yeah. Um, have you had a problem with that at all, like with uh, too, getting too many hits on your API or? Basically, uh, there won't be any problem because you can scale them up very easily. Because uh, basically what, what uh, Cloud Foundry does, right, you can just do CF scale instances, right, and then uh, they create a, an exact container of that what you did, uh, of, the, of the API endpoint. And if you probably, of course, if you, uh, if you hit like um, some kind of a threshold where, where, where things might break, right, uh, what Cloud Foundry does, it, it will restart the, the service. So that's a cool thing actually with this. Uh, hi. Uh, so that, that resonated with me with the whole throwing away models after a few months thing. Um, so my question is like the, the stuff that you showed, have you got like a step-by-step tutorial on your GitHub repository? Uh, basically, uh, as I said, the documentation is currently uh, not perfect, so oh, I, I had limited time, but um, I actually wrote a, um, an, like a blog on it, so uh, right. if you Google API, and yep. then first as uh, written, not, not API first, and then pivotal engineering block, then you will find something where, where you can read it. But uh, of course, uh, what I will do afterwards is I try to uh, uh, extend my documentation, right? Yeah, so. and just quickly, uh, so the app that you showed me, is it running on a free server, or is it? Uh, uh, basically, it's, it's running on uh, PWS, which is right. Pivotal Web Service. And right. Pivotal Web Service is, as, is like Cloud Foundry on AWS, and uh, yeah. Okay. Right, but of course um, you can use your own Cloud Foundry instance. So this uh, Cloud Foundry is open source, right? So you don't need to use uh, the the product by Pivotal, right? It is an open source project, right? You can uh, download Cloud Foundry and and also use it at your company. Any other question? All right, let's thank our speaker, Dad Tran. Cool. Once more. Thank you. <laughs>